welcome everyone. Nice to see your faces and also to see people online through Zoom. Um, my name is Sharon Mitten. I'm the Head of Fundraising and Philanthropy at The Florey. Before we begin, I would like to make a moment to reflect on the meaning of place and in doing so acknowledge the traditional owners of the country where we all are today. The Flory Institute is on the land of the Wurundjeri people of Kulin Nation. I'd like to pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging. We celebrate the traditional owners as the first scientists and deeply respect their sophisticated knowledge systems. For those attending who are not familiar with our work, the Flory is the largest brain research group in the Southern Hemisphere. Our work is critical as our diseases of the brain mind affect all of us in some way. In fact, every year, 4.7 million Australians are diagnosed with one of the conditions we study. This year and last year have highlighted the importance and the need of our work now more than ever uh, since our very beginning. Topics which we live and breathe daily as medical re as a medical research institute have been under the spotlight and in the public sphere. Thank you to all our donors who have joined us this afternoon. As a medical research institute, our work relies heavily on your support. Ways you can also support our research is by spreading the word of the Flory and the learnings you take away from this lecture today. If you're not already a Flory donor, we invite you to consider becoming one. All contributions, big and small, are tax deductible and take us one step closer in our quest to find the cures for diseases that affect the brain and mind. You can also support our work by leaving a gift in your will. If this is something you would like to consider, please email the fundraising team after the lecture. We'd also love to keep you up to date with the research happening at the Flory and invite you to join our mailing list. If you're not already a subscriber, a subscriber please head to the Flory website. I'd now like to introduce our two presenters. Professor Chris, Chris Reed is a principal research fellow and heads the network and neurodevelopment theme here at the Institute. Professor Reed is a translational neuroscience who investigates the molecular and cellular causes of epilepsy. He leads the neurophysiology of excitable network laboratory that includes multidisciplinary teams of four postdoctoral scientists, three research assistants, and two PhD students. He has published greater than 95 peer reviewed papers in high tier journals, including Brain, Neurology and Journal of Neuroscience. Professor Reed has strong engagement with industry and clinical partners, providing translational pathways for his research. This includes collaborating with BioCurates and CSL. He contributes significantly to the neuros neuroscience community, acting as a director of the Australian course in advanced neuroscience and sitting on the International League Against Epilepsy and American Epilepsy Society Genetic Task Forces. Now to Lauren. Lauren is partnering with, professional, with Professor Chris Reed today. Lauren is a final year PhD student working in this same laboratory. Her PhD studies have focused on a rare and severe type of epilepsy caused by mutations of the HCN1 gene. Her work has involved several collaborations, including with clinicians at the Austin Hospital and internationally with the laboratory of Dr. Santora at Columbia University, New York. She is the first author of the paper recently published in the science journal Brain, which explains how HCN1 mutations cause epilepsy and gives new ideas about the best way to treat this condition. Together, Chris and Lauren will explore their groundbreaking research at the Flory, which was inspired by a family's hope to help their young daughter had been diagnosed with a, rare, with a rare and severe form of epilepsy. I will now hand over to Professor Chris Reid. It's lovely to be here and it's um, a pleasure to be talking to you face to face and to those on Zoom. 
I, um, I'm going to talk to you, uh, the first part of the talk will be by me and then the second part by the star of the show, who's, who's Lauren. Uh, she's um, my PhD student, she's been fantastic. Um, and broadly speaking, the, the, the two projects that we're going to talk to you about today involve the more common epilepsy. So, you know, about 100, and I'll talk to you about a bit more detail, but 140,000 people have epilepsy. And the vast majority of those are more common type epilepsies. And we need to develop drugs that can treat across the broad spectrum of, of, of disease in that context. And then there's another subset of epilepsies, which Sharon has already alluded to, which are these really rare epilepsies. Um, they tend to be quite um, devastating. Um, they cause quite nasty um, seizures uh, that are drug refractory. Um, and the benefit that we have in those contexts, and that's the story that Lauren will give you, is that we know the genetic start point. Um, so although they're not common, they're, they're, they're almost more tractable in some ways because we can, we can we know where they, the start point is. So what I'm going to is to try and give you is that well, Lauren will give you the, the rare component and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the drug discovery program that we've developed um, to try and treat more common epilepsies using um, a, a centralized channel that's really important for seizure generalization. Um, I can see people, if people want to ask questions, at least in the audience here, please just knock and say hi and um, I'm happy to try and explain something. It's always very tricky as a scientist to try and get it across. And, Sometimes you feel like you're being condescending. Sometimes you feel like you're aiming too high. So I'll try my best. I want to start actually in the first instance on, on a sculpture, which I really like. And the reason I really like this sculpture is I th it, it predicts ep epilepsy, or at least what I feel epilepsy is. This sculpture was um, produced by um, Bodo Wenst. And he's a, a German. It's in the German um, um, Epilepsy Foundation. They have a, a, a museum there for epilepsy. And what it shows is what we all know about epilepsy with these patients sitting here having the full chronic clonic seizures. We know that these originate from the brain, which is the, the aspect of, of, of you know, the, the seizures and, and the manifestation of those seizures. But what's often forgotten is what other things happen. Um, and Sharon's just had a conversation about that recently about Tim, and Tim may even be on the, online actually. Um, just how difficult it is for these families to get out and do their bits and pieces. And that's as a family with a young child, but also as an individual. If you have epilepsy, you can't drive necessarily. You can't, but you feel you know, unlikely to want to go out into social environments where you might have a seizure. So they, they all withdraw within their, their own shell. So it's, I think it's a lovely way of depicting and remembering that we're not just treating the seizures, we're treating much more than the seizures. We're treating a disease that has impact way beyond and it's not an uncommon disease. Um, because of the stigmatization that's sometimes associated with epilepsy, people tend to forget about it. But as a, as a disease within the, the Australian society, not just Australia, but worldwide, um, there are a number of patients that aren't treat, um, that have epilepsy. And currently, this was just recent last year, this uh, Deloitte um, um, survey showed that there's about 140,000 Australians that currently have epilepsy. Um, the cost of that is not just the emotional cost that I've just talked about. There are real dollar costs as well, as with always. And this includes loss of income, people with young children not, that, that are really ill, not being able to get to work, those types of things. But, but the cost of this is significant, I mean, $12 billion a year to the Australian economy. So we, we're treating a, a, an economic issue as well as, a, as a, you know, a personal one as well. And here's the crux of the problem. About 30% of patients that have epilepsy do not respond to current anti-epileptic drugs. That's a third of the 120. You can do the maths. It's a lot uh, of patients. And even if they do respond, a lot of these uh, patients end up with quite nasty adverse side effects. So these include things like memory loss, sedation, inability to walk in a taxi, all these types of things um, that are not uncommonly actually stop them using the drug. They'd almost rather have the seizures than have the drug and deal with the consequences of that. So bottom line from this study is that, or not the study in this, this particular slide, is that we really is an urgent need for us to find novel therapeutics for, for what is a very devastating disease. So what I thought I might do um, initially just to, to give you a little bit of framework on, on me, and it's not about shining the spotlight on me because that's not what I'm good at. <laughs> but what it does, I hope, do, is shine a light on the plight of, of many um, the sciences that, um, scientists that have gone through my paradigm. So I completed my pharmacy degree in, um, in 1989. Yes, I'm that old. 
Um, it was in Tasmania, and then I moved to Canberra, um, and I, I just couldn't. Pharmacy is a great career, and I don't. It's not negative against it per se, but it wasn't me. I couldn't be the policeman and the postman, and just hand out drugs. I had to do something more productive and more uh, in, uh, inspiring, at least to me. Um, and that led me to do an honours at, at the John Curtin School of Medical Research, which is at ANU, and I continued on to do my PhD, which I did reasonably well at. I got a couple of lovely papers. This was not so much translational, but, but really enjoyed working on mechanisms of learning and memory, et cetera, et cetera. And that led to a, an absolute wonderful time as my first postdoc in London. And I keep on trying to get Lauren to go to London or somewhere overseas because there's a, an opportunity when you're a young scientist to, to realize that there's this big world. And it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. The point here, though, is that it was well funded. It's, I did well in my PhD. Lauren's in a similar position. She's going to be hopefully well funded. There's these early career fellowships that you could get onto. And I managed to achieve that reasonably well through NHMRC and Welcome. Came back to Australia, you're full of energy and you know, all guns raising um, or firing. Um, you've got your NHMRC funding, you've got ARC funding, but you're still not really a full scientist. It takes a, about a decade before you reach that point where you start to reach a, a level of independence. And this is what I've called the valley of death. This is where scientists are really starting to struggle a little bit because there's, there's the big money for the big guys at the top. And there's money for the, the early careers to sort of move forward. Even that's not easy, but, but, but at least it's tractable. And then there's this middle zone between the 10 and 20 years where it's a little bit tricky. And that's where the doubts came in. And the good looking fellow on the right and the lovely lady on the left just in front of us um, came to my rescue. Recognize them in the photograph. We we're looking a bit younger then, Carl. Yeah? <laughs> um, they, they supported me um, for three years on, on a wage. And sorry, I didn't know they were coming here. so. Big thank you. Um, so this allowed me to build the preclinical data that I'm going to talk to you about, about today. Um, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail. Um, and as I said, I find it a bit tricky sometimes. And so if, you, if there are issues, let me know. Um, but again, just a big thank you for that, that bridge that was necessary for me to get to where I am now. All right, so a bit more about the, the science. Um, iron channels and epilepsy. So who's here that knows what an iron channel is? And you guys can't say yes because <laughs> they, they, they're all not lay public, so that's not fair. <laughs> um, so I, your brain is an electrical organ, right? You sitting here thinking, listening to me, going, oh my goodness, what am I hearing? Is a series of events in your brain that are effectively electrical. Um, and the way that um, the body communicates electricity is it's, your, your cells are a membrane and then there's these, these channels that fit into that membrane. In fact, there's 300 of these different channels. They all have very unique and different um, jobs to do. But these channels can open and close really quickly and allow electricity to go through them backwards and forwards. And that gives these cells the ability to communicate. And it's still extraordinary to me that we've got a brain that, that, that is what it can do. The reason that they're important for epilepsy is because they open and close so quickly. So, you know, most things that happen in epilepsy happen on millisecond to, to microsecond timeframes, really, really frequent. So that's a thousandth of a second. Of, um, and these are, the, these are the guys, the iron channels are the guys that have that ability. They can open and close on microsecond timeframes. They're quite amazing in that regard. And it, so it comes as no surprise, really, when the genetics have started to get done, that iron channels became one of the more leading causes so when you had a mutation in a, in, a, in a gene, in a given gene, that gene then produces a, a protein. That protein then forms these channels that I'm talking about. The majority of those in the early years, at least, were shown to be ion channels, which is not unexpected. So we know that ion channels are important. The other reason that we know that ion channels are important for epilepsy is most of the anti-epileptic drugs that we have currently available to us act through these types of channels, okay? So we know that these types of channels are really important for epilepsy. So what is a channel, iron channel? I've already tried to explain it, but here's a little cartoon. Um, and I had a lovely little video, but it was on YouTube and it was just too complicated to get on onto the screen. But these are like just blobs of, of protein that sit in this membrane, you can see here. And these blobs of protein are closed under certain circumstances and open under other circumstances. And then what happens is once that opens, you get the flux of these ions. So this is just your table salt, right? In your, in your, uh, I don't know, in your, um, that you put on your meat at, at night. Um, we need salt, and the salt flows through these channels backwards and forwards. You've got potassium salt, you've got um, sodium salt, and you've got chloride, etc. 
these channels open and close and allow the flux of that. And I'm going to try and show you something a little bit more complicated in the next slide um, that, that sort of shows the types of things that these channels and how different they are and why we can try to target them for epilepsy and why it's important. That's sort of the crux of the first part of this talk. And in fact, the big crux played a big part of what um, um, Lauren's going to talk about as well. So that looks like a, um, a lot of information, and it is, and you don't really need to understand all the nuances of it. Um, but this is what these channels look like in, in, the, in the membrane themselves. So the, the four, four subunits put together, and in the middle of that subunit is a hole. Okay, And in that hole, all these the ions that I talked about flow through. Uh, if you take one of these subunits and you flatten it out, you get these quite intricate little proteins. So every one of these is like a little machine inside your head. It's quite extraordinary, actually. And that machine reacts to different things in different times. And in the case that we're looking at, which is the HCN channel, that's a voltage. So things becoming more hyperpolarized. So I'll try and explain that in a little bit more detail in a second. But when we hyperpolarize, these channels open and let that ion channel, that electrical charge through the, the, the neuron and then it changes the neuron's function so that it either does or doesn't talk to another person or another cell. When that goes wrong, when there's too much of it flowing through, and Lauren, Lauren will show you that perfectly in a minute, then you get too much activity and that's when you get your epilepsy. That's the bottom line that we're trying to trying to stop and achieve. And as I said, Lauren will probably show that more elegantly than I will, will show that. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully you've got a perception of what an iron channel is. This is a very um, scientific slide, and I do apologize, but the major reason that I want to um, bring this up is that the channels that we're looking at are these HCN channels that Sharon brought up. We've got HCN1, we've got HCN2, and we've got HCN4. So these are different genes that form different types of these channels. And the major thing for showing you this particular slide is to say that these one, two, and four are very, very different. And that's important for two reasons. One is that they do a very different job, and the second is that we can design drugs that hit these channels individually. We can potentially design something that, that impacts a certain specific job. And we think on the, the front, and I'll show you that in the next slide, that this guy here, the HN4, which turns on really slowly, I think even if you don't understand the electrophysiology, you can see that these guys turn on really quickly. These turn on really slowly, and then these to turn on really, really slowly. You can sort of see that, right? Even if you don't understand the electrophysiology behind it, you can see that these are very different types of things. So we think that these guys, because they turn on so slowly, if you imagine a seizure, um, what happens in a seizure is you, all your brain cells go off at the same time. They go bang, bang like that. And what happens when that happens, uh, that the event occurs, is that you get these periods of time between the, the, um, the, the big events, the, the sort of tonic big events, that are slow and, and uh, what are called big hyperpolarization. They're actually quite slow by, by the standards of what, what um, happens in, at the, in, within the neuron. And it's during that slow time that these guys get turned on. And during that slow period of time that they actually contribute to a, to a depolarization, which then makes them fire again. So they're like these pacemaking channels. And it's that pacemaking like activity that we want to try and stop. Now, why do we think HN4 channels are important? Well, one, they're very slow which I've just shown here. But the other is that they're perfectly positioned. They're in the right place, all right? So if we've got a, um, if we've got a, a, a target for a drug, it's got to be in the right place. And it's got to be doing the right thing in order for it to be um, effective. Um, and it turns out the HN4 channels are absolutely perfectly positioned. And that's just shown here. So this is HN1, 2, and 4. This is just a cartoon. And you can see HN4 channels are in this part of the brain. Now, the, the part of the brain is not that important. Um, in, in terms of what it's called, what's important is that it's perfectly positioned for the seizure, um, seizure generalization. And I'll show you that in a couple of slides. These other channels, one and two, are found all over the shop. You can see that they found much more ubiquitously. Um, and at the moment, what we think is that if we hit this and this channel here, and in fact, we already know that for this channel in particular, we're gonna get side effects, yeah? Because they're in the wrong place and they're doing slightly the wrong thing. <laughs> So the whole drug discovery program that we try to deliver now is to try and see whether we can get drugs that can just hit this guy because it's in the right place uh, doing the right things.
Okay, did that make sense? Yeah, okay, good. So that's the, the crux of the, the drug discovery program. We want to try and develop a drug uh, that has um, anti-convulsive, anti-convulsive just means anti-seizure um, effects, uh, and it's to target common epilepsies. All right, and really the bottom line of the whole program is, is sewn up in this little slide here. This is, um, this is the, uh, uh, the actual real experiment, which shows where this, 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 the yellow here, you can see it's just absolutely chock-a-block in a part of the brain called the thalamus. The thalamus is like a hub in the brain. It's like in the middle. So everything in your body goes through the, through the, the thalamus and into the cortex. And then and every time you want to move or do something different, it does the, the opposite, it comes back through the thalamus. What that means for epilepsy is it's really centrally positioned, right? <laughs> It's like the hub, it's, it's literally like a telephone hub. You can imagine the, the guy, the, the, the person, rather than have the telephones all over the shop, you've got the, the, um, the well, I'd say lady, but you gotta be careful these days, the, the person <laughs> in, um, putting um, the, um, you know, the little plugs into all the old telephones. You probably do remember, Carl, I don't quite remember that. <laughs> I should just have a quick funny story. I showed, I showed um, Lauren and, and a few of the others um, some slides today. You, you guys remember the days where you had to make slides? We used to actually put them into a slide container. And <laughs> they, they thought I was a dinosaur. Well, I am a dinosaur, but <laughs> that was proof that I was a dinosaur. Um, this, this is that hub. It's that real central hub. And what happens on the right-hand side here when you have an epileptic fit is that that fit will start somewhere in the brain. So there's something wrong in the brain somewhere, and it will generate a spark, and off that spark goes. Now, if that spark just stays localized, it still gives you a little bit of a fit, but it's not terrible. It's not an absolute, you know, it's not great, but it's not terrible. What really is bad is when the, I don't know if anybody, has anybody here seen a, 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 an epileptic fit? Sharon, anybody else? No? Yeah. And you, 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 you know the full tonic-clonic seizures. It's very, very confronting and very, very scary to see. Well, when that full tonic-clonic thing occurs, it occurs through the hub. Right? And I think that I think the cartoon shows that quite nicely. You have this really localized thing. If it stays there, it's all fine. But the minute it engages this hub, which is the thalamus, which is the area that I've been talking to you about, the minute it engages that and then goes back into the cortex, you can see that you can get this loop going. And it's that loop that causes those horrible seizures that we're talking about, the full genoclonic tonic clonic seizures. And what we've got. And even if you didn't quite understand the, the electrophysiologies, we've got a pacemaker comp, um, channel, something that paces something in the right place. It's stuck in, you know, right bang in the middle of, of where we, and it's not anywhere else, right? That's important because if it's elsewhere, then it's, we're going to have side effects. We're going to have impacts on, on how the, the brain works. Um, so we've got, a, I mean, that's the crux of the whole drug discovery. It took 20 years to get to that point. It sounds so bloody simple, doesn't it? <laughs> the amount of effort that's gone into it. So what, what I'm gonna show you next is just a couple of things that we've done to try and prove that that hypothesis, which is what it was initially, uh, was correct. And the one way that we can achieve that is by creating a knockout mouse. Now that's knockout mouse is no more complicated than what it sounds. You get the HN4 channel and you knock it out. <laughs> Now, this is all very complicated and it just makes me look smart, which is not true. <laughs> but um, essentially, we, we, we've just crossed a few mice lines and we know here in the green, this is where we're knocking out the, the, the actual HN4. And you can see here, this big central part is bright, bright green. So we know that we're knocking it out in that area that we want to knock it out. With. So nothing more complicated than that. We did some experiments just to show that we were doing what we were doing. So here we have, um, this is mRNA, which is um, you know, your DNA, mRNA through to, to protein. Um, so the mRNA is, is definitely down. So we definitely know that we're knocking it down. And then we actually looked at some protein levels as well. And we show that it's very much down in all the areas, including the thalamus. With me. So all of a sudden we've got a brain in a mouse that doesn't have the target that we want in it. Yeah, it's gone. Um, and then we wanted to see, well, does that actually make an impact on a seizure? And the way that we do that, it's, it's actually not that complicated. It's a relatively simple test. Um, and I'll focus on the one on the left-hand side. This is um, a thing called subcutaneous PTZ. This drug was actually used in humans uh, to evoke seizures 
um, in epilepsy, not in epilepsy patients, in, um, in schizophrenic patients in, in the early days. Because they used to think that if you had a seizure, you could overcome. And, and there, there is some evidence to suggest that it might have even been effective. So if I gave you this drug, everybody here would have a seizure. The point is that how quickly you have that seizure would be very different for the different people in this room. And some people will be resistant to seizures and other people will be quite sensitive to seizures. What we're doing here is using the same model, um, but in, obviously in the, in the mouse environment, to show that um, if we get rid of our target, which is the HM4 target, and remove it from the brain, that we get this right shift. And what that means is it takes a lot longer for those particular mice to get the seizure relative to what they were before. So it's telling us that our target, which is the pacemaker target in the right place, if we remove it, actually protects you from having a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, um, which was very exciting. Um, and on the right-hand side, it's just the same experiment with just a slightly different compound doing the same thing. So I won't go into that in any great detail. Um, but we showed it a number of times and we showed it in a number of different ways. <clears throat> this mouse has very little side effects. So these are a whole lot of behaviour tests. I'm not going to go to them in any detail. But like I said, because this isn't spread everywhere across the brain, when you knock it out, it only really has a limited effect on the way that the, the thing... So we think that the, the, the actual... Um, knocking it out is, is not, not, not likely to have very severe side effects. Remember the first thing I talked about was adverse side effects have been particularly negative. Well, if we give the classic anti-epileptic drugs in any of these sort of behaviours, we would see changes. We would definitely see changes, but we're not seeing them in the knockout mouse. So what we're hoping is that we've got something that is good without bad, <laughs> if that makes sense. Okay, so the other thing that we did as well was to, um, to find a small molecule. And this is with a collaborator in Florence. If you're ever a scientist and you're going to do um, decent collaborations, always do it with somebody in Florence because it's a great place to visit <laughs> for no other reason. Um, anyway, she, she's actually a world expert on HDN channel um, molecules and she's designed a, a channel blocker. Now this is not perfect. With the knockout we can be really quite specific. This is a little bit dirty. But we've got this molecule and this molecule um, is um, it, it penetrates into the brain, so we know it is. We've got a very short half-life, but we could work with that. And then when I mean, the bottom line is, when the hypothesis is we've got a drug that is blocking this channel, we should see anti-seizure effects, right? We should see it stopping the seizures themselves. And lo and behold, it does. So that was exciting. Um, and it's on the back of that. And essentially what I showed you now is what I showed to venture capitalists. Not much different, you know, a few, few subtle differences in the way that I would have announced it and, and you know, maybe none of the funny stories is inside. <laughs> but um, that was enough for them to get very interested in our program. Um, and that, all that work was actually done um, while, you know, I was on the Down Fellowship. So, again, a big thank you for that. So we took it to the venture capitalist and um, they, they've started a drug discovery program. We've only just moved into the, the, the realm of, you know, plenty of value of deaths in this talk. I've just realised I've said it twice. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think probably all of you have seen this idea that translating the basic finding, which I showed you today, getting a venture capitalist excited and then going forward um, is, a long, is a long track. Um, but we are moving forward and we're moving forward pretty well. We've got, I think we've screened over 400 compounds now. And some of the compounds that we're showing, even today, we had a, a meeting just before this meeting, in fact, that showed that the, some of these compounds are beginning to work. So it's exciting. It's very, very exciting. Um, and the last slide, I think it's the last slide of mine, is it? Yeah, I've got a summary slide after this. It's just to, to highlight that, you know, you have an idea and it's awesome, or it could be, you know, certainly exciting enough to be looking forward to. You then get a venture capitalist on board and then you realise the work starts. You know, this is just a, a list of what we're doing currently. You've got to know that it works in a preclinical model. You've got to know that it doesn't hit a certain channel in the heart. You've got to know that it gets across the blood brain barrier. You've got to, you know that it doesn't have toxicity. So the, the actual, how a drug ever gets developed, I don't know. <laughs> the chemists seem to prom promise me that we will get somewhere. And we have, we've moved, we've, we've already moved to the point where we've got molecules now that um, from our start point to where we are now that have less side effects including heart side effects on the hearts, et cetera, et cetera. So in summary, I hope I convinced you that HN4 channels are positioned to modulate the lemocortical excitability. Um, the, the pharmacology, which is the, the, the um, Florence drug, worked and the genetic block worked. Um, 
that we don't seem to have huge amounts of liability. By our liability, I mean side effects of these drugs. Um, the drug didn't have very many side effects either, although it, it does have a very short half-life, so we, we probably need to look at that in a bit more detail. And then, um, you know, stating the very obvious is um, small molecule drug discovery is certainly not easy, but it's been fun and we are moving forward. So what I'd like to do now is pass over to, um, to Lauren. I, I don't know if Tim is on, online. Um, this little story, and I think you probably tell tell the story a little bit, was um, was an initiation with um, initiated by a, a meeting with a dad, um, Tim, and it's been you know I think we've formed a friendship as well. Um, interesting journey, both emotionally and um, um, and scientifically. So I'll let Lauren take it over from there. Thanks, Chris. Um, it's great to be be here today. Um, I want to tell you all a story. It is a scientific story, of course, but perhaps more so than that, this is a story about people. It's a story about the people behind why we do what we do. So I'd like to begin by introducing you to one of those people. This is Ebony. Ebony is a four-year-old South Australian girl. She's very energetic, very sociable, and very well loved by her family. So this is her mum, Ali, her dad, Tim, and Ebony's the middle child in her family. She's got an older brother and a younger brother. The other thing that you should know about Ebony is that she has a severe form of epilepsy. Ebony had her first seizure when she was only three months old. After her second seizure, she was rushed to hospital where she had to stay for several months as the doctors tried desperately to figure out what was causing her epilepsy and to try and get her seizures under control. In the end, they had to try seven different anti-epileptic drugs before they found the combination that worked. And because Ebony's epilepsy was so severe, she had to be on very high doses of these drugs, which came with a lot of side effects, including the risk for permanent eye damage and liver damage. Ebony's condition is known as developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, or DEE for short. Uh, children patients with DE have severe seizures that often don't respond to anti-epileptic drugs, but they also have developmental delays. So, for example, in this very cute picture of Ebony taken a couple of weeks ago at Easter, you can see that she's walking with a walking frame. Now, this is an excerpt from an email that Chris received from Ebony's father, Tim, um, a little while back, which I think really summarises the, the severity of the situation that we're talking about here. Tim wrote, Ebony is going okay, has had a few seizures with fevers since we spoke last. The last few crept up on us before we could get her temperature under control. And the last one was four tonic-clonic seizures, so these are severe convulsive seizures, four of them in a row at 4am in the middle of a thunderstorm. Developmentally, she's about 12 months behind, which is more of a concern than the seizures, to be honest. She has a few words, but these come and go. So obviously, not only is Ebony's epilepsy severely impacting her own life, but also that of her family, who are consistently having to worry about when is their young daughter going to have another seizure. Now, as Chris introduced, um, our lab focuses on HCN channels, and Ebony's epilepsy is caused by a mutation in one of these channels, her HCN1 channel. Now, HCN1 has only recently been identified to cause epilepsy. The first HCN1 mutations to cause epilepsy were published in 2014. But in the last seven years, scientists and doctors have now discovered more than 50 mutations in HCN1 that can cause epilepsy. And the interesting thing here is the more we look, the more we seem to find. So while HCN1 epilepsy at the moment seems to be a very rare condition, it might not be quite as rare as we think. Ebony's particular mutation is this one here, HCN1 M305L which basically means that at position 305 in the HCN1 channel protein, where there's usually an M in ebony, it's been replaced by an L. Now, this might sound like a very subtle difference, but as we're learning, if these very small changes happen in the wrong spot, the outcome can be pretty catastrophic. This image here shows the structure of the HCN1 channel. Um, on the left-hand side, this is a um, side-on view of the channel in the membrane. But perhaps more interesting, this is a top-down view that Chris was explaining earlier. And you can see the channel pore in the middle here, where all of those salts, those currents flow through. And in purple, I hope you can see there, and there is position 305, where the M usually is, where Ebony's mutation has occurred. Um, now, as Chris said, this project came about because Tim, Ebony's dad, reached out to Chris. Um, Tim had been made aware of Chris's research in HCN1 channels and basically reached out and said, 
our young daughter's just been diagnosed with epilepsy caused by an HCN1 mutation and we're aware of your research into HCN channels. Is there anything you can do? So what we've done is we've made a mouse model that has basically the mouse version of Ebony's epilepsy. This is the HCN1 M294L knock-in mouse. Now, these numbers are slightly different because the mouse gene is slightly different than the human gene. So I'll be using M294L to refer to the mouse and M305L to refer to the human case, but they're functionally the same thing. Um, and our aim was to use this mouse to study how these mutations cause epilepsy and ideally um, whether we could use them to get ideas about how to treat these forms of epilepsy. But the first challenge was this question I've asked here, does this mouse have epilepsy? Because although we use mice a lot in genetic research, mice are not little humans. There are significant differences in their genetics that sometimes mean that when we make a mouse model with a human genetic mutation, the mouse just might not have epilepsy. So we started by looking at the EEG brain activity of these mice. So EEG is a technology that you can use in humans or in mice, and it involves recording the brain activity from the cortex, the outermost layer of the brain. Um, so this um, picture here shows the sort of EEG activity that you would expect in what we've called a wild type WT mouse. So this is a mouse that doesn't have epilepsy, a perfectly healthy, normal mouse. Now, our HCN1 M294L mice turned up in our lab in December 2018, right before Christmas. Um, Chris was about to fly off to Germany for a meeting with some colleagues who also work on HCN1. I was probably planning my Christmas holiday, let's face it. <laughs> um, and then these mice turned up and so we're like, great, we've got a little bit of time. Let's rush in, do these EEG experiments and see what we find. And this is what I got from one of the first two mice that I recorded the EEG on. And we were pretty happy to see it because these mice had these big spikes that you just don't see on the EEGs from wild type mice. And this was fantastic news for us because it shows that these mice do have epilepsy. So Chris was able to take this data as he flew off to uh, meet with our colleagues to say, look, we've got a mouse model of epilepsy and now we'll come back start of next year and see where we go from here. So obviously um, epilepsy, the epileptic seizures are not the only way that Ebony is, is um, affected by her condition. So we wanted to look at a couple of other um, uh, elements of the, of the mouse's what we call phenotype, how the mouse's condition overall. The first one we looked at was the movement of these mice because Ebony's parents had told us that Ebony herself was a very physically active young girl. The way we study this in mice is we place them in an open arena that's about 30 centimetres by 30 centimetres in size. So if you imagine like a standard ruler sort of size. And this um, arena automatically tracks how the mice move in a set period of time. And we were able to show that our M294L mice moved a significantly further distance in the same amount of time than our wild type mice. So they also have this behavioural kind of hyperactivity. The next thing we looked at was learning in these mice because patients with HCN1 epilepsy have learning delays, or a lot of them often have learning delays. The way we studied this in the mice was using a Barnes maze test. So this is a test of long-term spatial learning, and it involves a mouse learning the location of a target on the outside of a maze based on visual cues that they can see around the room that they're in. Um, and we run this test every day for seven days. And if a mouse is learning, it gets quicker at finding the target over the course of that, of the experiment. So we were able to show, looking in red here, that our m 294 l mice were indeed able to learn because by day seven, they were finding the target more quickly than they did on day one. However, they learned much more slowly than the wild type mice. So we were able to show that these mice do have a learning deficit. And finally, and probably the, the most serious part of my talk today, is that we looked at the survival of these mice. Because one of the scariest parts of having epilepsy for patients and their loved ones is that people with epilepsy are susceptible to a condition known as SUDEP, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. This is, as the name suggests, where a person with epilepsy dies suddenly, unexpectedly, and with no clear cause of death identifiable on post-mortem, although complications from a seizure are assumed to be the cause. And we were able to see that our M294L mice had an increased susceptibility to sudden death. 
So obviously this really hammers home the importance of understanding these epilepsy conditions and also finding ways of treating them and getting them under control. So now that we know that we have a mouse model that has this DEE, this type of epilepsy, we wanted to dive more deeply into the mechanism underlying this. How does this mutation cause the HCN1 channel dysfunction? And how does this channel dysfunction cause brain cell or neuron dysfunction and therefore epilepsy? We use two different um, techniques to study this and I thought I'd spend a little bit of time on them because I think they're pretty cool. The first one uses frog eggs of all things, um, specifically oocytes, egg cells from this Xenopus laevis frog. So what we do in these experiments is we take the frog eggs and we get them to express HCN1 channels, either wild type channels, mutant channels, or a combination of the two. And we can then record the currents that pass across the membrane of these egg cells. The advantage of this is that frog eggs don't naturally have too many different currents in them. So it allows us to isolate the effect of just what HCN1 is doing in a much more simple system. But obviously, neurons are far more complex than this. Um, they have a much more complicated structure, and they also have a lot of different ion channels, as Chris outlined in his section of the talk. So in order to study what this mutation is doing in neurons, I use a technique called whole cell patch clamp electrophysiology. A silly name, a very technical name, but you don't need to worry about the details. Basically, what it involves is we I deeply anesthetize a mouse, take the brain and cut very, very thin sections of it, sections that are about a third of a millimetre thick. And I then use a very fine tip glass pipette. So you can see that here in this slide. Imagine like a very, very thin glass straw. And I basically use this to latch onto a brain cell and then record the currents that pass across the, the membrane of the brain cell. And obviously this allows us to see what these mutations are doing in the context of a neuron. So here's some data that we got from the frog egg, the oocyte experiments initially. On the left, the, these are currents recorded from an oocyte that expresses just the wild type HCN1. And on the right, currents that are expressed in, um, currents shown in an oocyte expressing a combination 50-50 wild type and 50% um, of the of Ebony's mutation. And if you eyeball this, the difference at first looks pretty obvious, right? It's there. The wild type currents are much bigger. And so a couple of my colleagues did these experiments and they bring this data to the lab meeting and say, this is, this is what we're getting in our oocytes. The tricky thing here was that it just didn't quite line up with the data that I was getting from my um, whole cell, from my recordings from the neurons. And so we were all left scratching our heads for a bit. And science does this to you sometimes. Sometimes things just don't completely add up until Chris had a brainwave at one point. What if the obvious explanation is actually not the right one. What if we're just looking in the wrong place? So instead of looking at that, those maximum cuts, I want to zoom in on these areas in the green boxes here at the top of the recordings. Because this was our aha moment, our eureka moment, um, the, the, discovery, the discovery days that are the best part of doing science in my opinion. Um, looking first at the wild type on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see that at the top here, all of these lines are stacked on top of each other. You don't need to know too many details. Basically, what this means is that these channels are shut. These lines are stacked on top of each other. The channels are closed. They're not passing current. But over here, um, in the oocytes that expressed some of Ebony's mutant HCN1 um, channels, you can see that there's still gaps between these lines. This means that these channels have stayed open and continue to pass current. And this is the core of the problem. This is the underlying reason behind Ebony's epilepsy. Her HCN1 channels are staying open when they shouldn't be. So before I go on to the next bit, I just want to recap a little bit about the role of HCN1 channels in the, in the brain cells, although Chris went through it quite a bit in his talk. Basically, brain cells like sitting at a very comfortable sort of resting state, a bit like a Goldilocks zone, if you will. They don't like being too far above this. They don't like being too excited because this means that they could start firing too much. And if they fire too much, this causes epilepsy. But they also don't like being too far below this state because this means they couldn't respond to inputs if they did come in. They need to stay in this kind of just right zone. And this is what HCN1 channels do. 
If these cells fall too far below their state, the HCN1 channels are open, the current flows through, and this brings them back up to their resting state. If the cells go too far above the resting state, the HCN channels shut, the current stops flowing through, and this brings them back down to the resting state in the opposite direction. If you look at the blue images on this slide, that's what a wild type HCN1 channel does. When the cell is far away from firing, the wild type HCN1 channels are open. When the cell gets close to firing, the wild type channels close. The thing is, we just don't see this with our mutant HCN1 channels. When the cells are far away from firing, the M305L mutant channels are open. But when the cell gets close to firing, they don't close normally. And this leads to what one of my colleagues, Chase Lee McKenzie, came up with the, the term for it, a leaky tap channel. So basically, you all know the, the thing with a leaky tap. You turn it off as far as it can go, and yet the water still keeps dripping through. That's pretty much what we have going on with these M305L channels. We've turned, we've, the brain cell is in a situation that should have turned these channels all the way off, but they're still staying open a little bit, and a little bit of current is leaking through. And this means that these cells are always very close to firing. The smallest amount of input can set them off. And too much firing leads to epilepsy. So this explains how Ebony's mutation causes her epilepsy. This leaky tap HCN1 channel makes it easier for the brain cells to fire, and this causes epilepsy. Um, and in some really exciting news, we've just had this work published in a big uh, neurology journal called Brain. And this is, this is exciting because it now means that our findings are out there. So other scientists and medical doctors can use what we've found out to help them make decisions on where to go next with their research or how to treat their own patients. And speaking of treating patients, let's get back to Ebony and one of the main reasons we're doing this work. Can we use what we now know to find out the best available treatments for Ebony? I'm going to take you back to some more EEG experiments, like what I said earlier in the talk. Um, so in these experiments, we're recording the brain activity of the mice before we give them a drug, and then we'll give the mice one of a number of anti-epileptic drugs and see what these drugs do to the overall brain activity. We started with two drugs, sodium valproate and lamotrigine. We selected these two drugs because they're both drugs that Ebony has tried and she experienced very different outcomes with them. So sodium valproate is a drug that she's still being treated on today because it helps to improve her seizures. Whereas lamotrigine was a drug that she tried out at one time, but very quickly stopped taking it because it made her epilepsy worse. And in some good news, our mice responded the same way. When we gave them valproate, the frequency of these EEG spikes reduced. And when we gave them lamotrigine, the frequency of the spikes significantly increased. So this is great because one of the biggest um, problems for a lot of patients with epilepsy is the process of getting appropriate treatment can be a bit of an odyssey. And it's often done by trial and error. And so this can involve trying a whole bunch of drugs that have bad side effects that may not work, but may even make things worse. In this case, we hope that we can use the mice to test potential drugs and then be able to recommend only the ones that work in the mice, hopefully helping these patients avoid this kind of treatment odyssey. So here's some ongoing work that I'm doing in the lab at the moment. This graph shows the effect of six different anti-epileptic drugs that we've tried on the EEG activity of the mice. Each bar looks at the effect of one drug on the frequency of those spikes compared to the frequency at baseline before we've given any drugs. And that here is normalized to 100%. So basically anything below 100 shows a reduction in the spikes. Anything above 100 shows an increase in the spikes. As you can see, as well as valproate, we found two other drugs, levetiracetam and ethosuximide, that also reduced the EEG spike frequency, suggesting that these might be other alternative drugs that these patients could use. At the other end of the spectrum, as well as lamotrigine, we found that topiramate and ritigavine significantly worsened the spiking, potentially suggesting that these drugs should be avoided in patients with HCN1 epilepsy. 
And the good news is all of these drugs are approved for use in humans. So neurologists and clinicians can take our findings and use them straight away in deciding which of these drugs to prescribe to their patients. And finally, where to from here? Well, I know where I want to take this work. I want to take this work into the realm of precision medicines. So one of the biggest troubles with most anti-epileptic drugs today, which Chris alluded to, is that these drugs target just one thing, the seizures. And they do so by pretty much dampening down brain activity as a whole. They often don't treat any of the other symptoms, things like developmental delays, and they often have a lot of side effects. The advantage of precision medicines is that they target the particular cause of the epilepsy. So in this case, if we were developing a, tre a precision treatment for somebody like Ebony, we'd have a drug that targets just the HCN1 channel, which ideally would treat both her seizures and other symptoms while minimising side effects. Here at the Flory, um, our lab is looking at HCN channels, but there are other labs that are looking at potential precision medicines for a wide range of other epilepsy conditions. And the reason we want to do this is pretty obvious. We want more, uh, I, I want to be sent more photos like this. We want more stories like this. Stories where these patients can hit their milestones, like Ebony on her first day of pre kindy where they can go out and have adventures and them and their families can live their lives without the constant worry of epilepsy hanging over their heads. So all it remains for me to do is to thank a couple of people. Firstly, everybody in the Reed Laboratory who's been involved in this work. I want to specifically point out Kais here, who did a lot of the work that Chris presented in his talk about HCN4, um, and Kais has just been awarded his PhD. But really, everybody on this list here has contributed substantially to everything we've presented today. Um, thank you to those who funded the research. Um, a huge thank you to Ebony's family for giving us permission to share their story. And finally, thanks to everybody here and online for attending. Thank you, Lauren. Um, powerhouse. Of... Is there any, are there any questions? Have you got anything to, to ask? Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, how does Australia uh, compare to other countries in the number of people who have epilepsy? in terms of treating it and i mean we've got a fantastic um healthcare system here um and you know in fact it's the small irony of, of melbourne is it's the epicenter of, of epilepsy research we have three or four major clinical groups we've got mark cook we've got sam berkovic who was an ingrid sheffer who developed um the, the whole genetic epilepsy so in many ways i think we're leading we're leading well i not think i think we we definitely are leading the pack, um, both from a clinical perspective and from a research perspective. Um, and most of that's been led within, you know, within a three or so kilometre radius of here. Terry O'Brien's across the, the, the way now a bit, but um, yeah, we're in a very good spot to, to really make big efforts. I should also mention that the Flory, um, so Steve, Stephen Petru, I'm sure at some point has given a talk in this context, is, um, has just started some um, some major um, drug discovery efforts around the precision medicine approaches that um, Lauren has just said that we would be like them to do for HGN1. And those have been had both commercial success and looking like they'll have success at the patient level as well. If you want to add to that. Um, no, I think you covered most of it. I mean, epilepsy in general affects people all over the world. And the trouble with a lot of these conditions is that we don't really have cures for a lot of them. We just have treatments that in ideal cases can stop the seizures. But I mean, people, yeah, people all over the world from all backgrounds are affected by epilepsy. And so it's, it shows how important it is to keep this research going. Any other questions? We've had a few come through by the chat, so I might just read them out to you both. Sure. Um, Brian would like to know, what accounts for epilepsy in some syndromes and epilepsy with developmental delay in others? That's not an easy um, question to Thanks, answer. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, you know, I, I think what we're finding more and more, and this has been led by the genetic revolution, as we understand the genetic architecture of the epilepsies, we understand more and more that, as an example, the HN1 channels, if you have a, a variant in a channel and it breaks the channel, like completely breaks the channel, 
um, you're much more likely to end up with autism and some sort of developmental delay. Whereas if you have the problems that we've seen with ebony, which is again an aberrant function, you're more likely to see epilepsy. Um, so as we start to unravel that genetic architecture, as we start to see more and more patients, we'll get a firmer handle on, at least for those rarer conditions, um, what's causing or why, you know, why some things or some patients with a variant will have a certain set of phenotypes and why some sets will have another. For, for the general population, I think it's becoming clearer and clearer and it, it's much more difficult to, to um, unravel. Um, but we all have some, you know how I talked about having given you all PTZ, which I wouldn't do, I promise, but <laughs> um, that, that each of you would have a slightly different um, reaction to that in terms of having a seizure. Some of you would be quite resistant to it and some of you wouldn't. Um, that, that's a, a good experiment, a mental experiment to think of, of, of all of us have some susceptibility to, to having a seizure. Um, and what's, what the underlying cause behind that is almost certainly genetic but not entirely genetic. There will be also be environmental factors, things like hypoxia in birth, things like um, viral infections, things like uh, head trauma. Um, but there seems to be a, a very critical interplay. So we've got these things called these polygenic risk scores, which, you know, Carl will have a polygenic risk score of, of five and I'll have one of 10, which means if, if I have a hit on the head, you know, I'm five times more likely to have um, a, a seizure than say Carl would have based on the genetic background. So you need both. You need that that insult, but the genetic background is always there as something that's protective. Um, and you know, again, Melbourne's at, at the forefront of understanding that. Um, people work with um, Ingrid Sheffer and, and Sam Berkovic have done these massive studies where they've booked at four thousand patients, and they're starting to work out there's not just one gene that's causing even the common epilepsies. It's more likely three or four. So all of us may even have one or two of those in our own in our bodies now, but if we combine the three together or four together, sometimes it might take five, you end up having having epilepsy. So hopefully I got that across, but um, yeah, we, we, we're getting there. And I think most of it is, you know, most of our understanding will come at least initially from our understanding of the genetic architecture of epilepsy. This one popped up earlier in the talk. So I think it's for you, Chris, probably. Um, Leo would like to know, does this talk suggest that HCN4 is redundant? It's a, good, it's, a, it's a really, really good scientific question. That's one I've been asked before. Um, you, you know, it's, it's a valid, it's a valid um, you know, question and it's something that people ask a lot is, well, what the hell is it doing if it's not doing anything? Um, and the, the one thing I didn't tell you about my model was that it was um, knocked out late in development. So a little bit like you would give a drug it's not, we haven't knocked it out right from the day of birth. It's been knocked out right late, late, late in, in, in adulthood. Um, and that's how you would envisage a drug being given. It's not an HN4 blocker wouldn't be given from birth. It would be given as a, to an adult. So that was the reason for doing that. So we think that there are probably some important um, components around um, that developmental time window. So these pacemaking channels, um, when your brain develops, the activity is important as to how they develop. Uh, and these channels would certainly modulate that. So we think that there might be some subtle differences associated with that. So that's one issue. And the other thing that we should also note um, is that when you knock out something, you often get some compensatory effect from something else as well. Um, and we do know that HN2 and HN1 probably compensate a little bit for, for some of the underlying deficits so that the knockout itself is not completely, it's gone, you know, knocking it out doesn't mean it's not doing anything at all. I hope that answered your question. Great response to me. Just one new question just popped up, so I'll just read it out literally. Um, it's from Hugh. Hugh's interested, he looks after a, a six year old girl with HCN1 epilepsy, um, in whom only, I'm going to say this incorrectly, topiramate. Yeah. Okay, that's the drug, has helped improve the seizures, but not the development delay. Does this mean her ion channels behave differently than most children with HCN1 epilepsy, or is there some other explanation? I mean, I can, I can take this one. Um, the answer to that is not necessarily. So there, 
of those 50 or so HCN1 mutations that have been identified, only a small number of them have been looked at in any sort of detail. So we imagine that some of these um, genetic mutations will work like Ebony's mutation. They'll keep this channel open when it shouldn't be. But others might work a totally different way. You know, they, they might make the channel function less, as we, we would call a loss of function mutation. So there's if the... Uh, mutation itself causes different changes to how the channel works, you then expect different drugs to be effective in, in those sorts of contexts. So there's every chance that if this particular young girl's mutation works differently to Ebony's mutation, then the drugs that would be needed to treat it would also be different. I think the other important point to put into context, um, the work that Lauren produced was, or showed right at the end, was only on the seizure correlate, it wasn't on behaviour. So we haven't looked at behaviour and the impact of these drugs on that behavioural phenotype, uh, but that's something that we would like to do. Um, and also the precision medicine approach, again, as Lauren articulated beautifully in her talk, argues that, um, that these basic anti-epileptic drugs aren't necessarily going to be able to be treating the, the underlying comorbidities and that we might need a precision medicine where we're dealing with the actual deficit itself. Um, and we are, I mean, to be, you know, it's, it's sad to say, but we are still some way off having achieved that, although a lot closer than we were perhaps um, a few years ago. What a way to kickstart our lecture series for the year. Um, your enthusiasm and energy today <laughs> off the charts. Also the ground that you covered um, from start to finish from those early journey, Chris, and the pitfalls along the way, the recognition along the way, um, you know, it's all important for us to hear about, um, hearing about your journey now, starting. Start, start, start. Um, Very exciting. And also, importantly, the human element, Ebony's story. I got to speak with the Nana today and um, extraordinary what they're, they're suffering um, at this, this ho horrible uh, rare disease um, and the fact that your models are fine tuning away um, from the human element and um, getting into that pre precision medicine also um, so good for us to hear about um yeah and 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 hearing about ebony today from a nana and what she suffers from um and, and if we yeah and the rooster and all sorts of stories <laughs> that thunderstorm <laughs> the thunderstorm and the rooster um but no um please join me in thanking uh chris and um, today